we are going to Galatians 4.21 today to start. Um, this is generally considered to be one of the hardest sections in all of Paul's writing to understand. So the way this is going to work today is we're going to have to do some digging, and, it, and it's going to, for a while, probably feel a little bit irrelevant, like how does this apply to my life? But I hope that those questions get answered by the time we get to the end here. But we do have to do some digging to try to um, draw the meaning out of the text. Uh, to kind of know what the text is saying, we, we need to know in general what Paul's saying in this book. And next week, we'll get to Galatians 5.1, where it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And, and that verse might be the theme verse in the entire book of Galatians. And starting in a couple weeks, we'll start to see how knowing Jesus gives us freedom to walk in the spirit. It gives us freedom to build one another up, to restore one another. It gives us freedom to avoid the works of the flesh, like, like jealousy and fits of anger and envy and drunkenness. And then it gives us freedom to have desires that are so changed that we can do what we truly now want to do, which is with changed desires, we want to bear the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace and patience. And so, so we'll see the ways that Jesus gives us freedom from sin. But in the next few weeks, we're kind of wrapping up the last few passages where the other side of the coin is presented, where Jesus frees us from the pressure of having to work our way to God. So he frees us both from the, the ceremonial law of the Old Testament but then also he frees us from feeling like we earn our place with God through any kind of obedience at all. And, and just to be clear, as Paul says all this, he's not throwing out the role of obedience in the Christian life. He's throwing out some obedience. We no longer need to obey the, the things that were shadows of Jesus, like the temple and the ceremonies and the dietary restrictions and the feast days. But, but he's not throwing out all obedience because moral commands stand. I mean, the, the Ten Commandments, those are reflections of the holiness of God. Those didn't change when Jesus came. God said, don't lie because he's true. And he didn't cease to be true when the Lord came. And so that command didn't go away. But even when it comes to the moral commands, Paul here is clarifying that following those commands never, never did and never will get us to God. It never got us where we could make ourselves acceptable to a holy God by the things we do. And so in Galatians, Paul is emphasizing this and re-emphasizing this because the church in Galatia was being swayed by these people called the Judaizers. And these were people who had come down from Jerusalem who believed that it was only through becoming fully Jewish that a person could come to God. And, and they were definitely glad that Gentiles were coming to the faith as well as Jews. But they were convinced that to be saved, to really be fully Christian, those Gentiles were going to have to learn to fully adhere to all the ceremonial laws, including circumcision, dietary restrictions, special holidays, observances in the temple. And, and these Judaizers were persuasive. They were relatively good moral people. They had good values. They had dynamic teachers among them. But they were missing the big E on the I chart when it comes to what it takes to know God. And what's essentially an expanded version of Galatians in the book of Romans, Paul's talking about the people who think this way, his Jewish brothers who are coming to faith in Jesus, but thinking that there's still more work that needs to be done to establish their own righteousness. And he says there's a key piece of ignorance underneath that. And in Romans 10 verse 1, he said, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. So he says the reason that people think that they can work their way to God is they're ignorant of how righteous and holy God is. That God doesn't have a spot of sin or shame within him. And his demand on our lives is to be as holy as he is. And if we see him as that holy, and we see ourselves, honestly, there's no way we could ever think that we could measure up. I mean, if you walk up to the base of Mount Everest in your shorts and your t-shirt and you say, I'm going to climb this mountain today. And then you start to climb up that mountain on a whim, without equipment, without preparation. It's all because you don't understand the mountain that you're climbing. And this is the tallest mountain in the world. This has claimed a lot of lives. The, the weather is terrible. You need oxygen to go up there. You need training. You can't just do that on a whim in your gym clothes. And if we think, I'm going to be religious and do some good stuff now so I can be right with God by my efforts, it's because we are absolutely ignorant of how holy he is. 
Arthur Pink writes, because God is holy, acceptance with him on the ground of creature doings is utterly impossible. A fallen creature could sooner create a world than produce that which would meet the approval of infinite purity. Can darkness dwell with light? Can the immaculate one take pleasure in filthy rags? The best that sinful man brings forth is defiled. A corrupt tree cannot bear good fruit. God would deny himself and vilify his perfections were he to account as righteous and holy that which is not so in itself. And so it's good for us to work to obey God. It's good for us to examine ourselves and to turn from sin. It's good to practice our spiritual disciplines like reading our Bibles and going to church and worshiping. And all of those endeavors are energized by the new faith that we have in Christ. But none of those things is even the first step in making us acceptable to God. They're not even part of what gets us in the door with him. They're not even part of what gets us to heaven or what makes us Christians. The Heidelberg Catechism says, this is because the righteousness which can stand before the judgment seat of God must be perfect throughout and wholly conformable to the divine law. But even our best works in this life are all imperfect and defiled with sin. So we're supposed to hear all those laws and know that they reflect God's character and say, man, if I am ever going to be righteous before God, I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need Christ. And so Romans 10, 4 says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So recognizing how perfect God is sends us trusting in Christ. It sends us away from trusting in ourselves. To know God is to know that we can't get to him on our own. And the main point of the commands is to get you to run to Jesus to drive you to realize the fact that you need a savior, to realize you could never measure up, and then to cause you to see in Jesus the savior that you need. So it's good to know and and try to follow the commands of God, but the message of those commands is not God helps those that help themselves. The message of those commands is you can't possibly help yourself enough to please God. You need Jesus. And so in Galatians 4.21, Paul opens up another line of argument against our legalistic hearts, our hearts that love to just think that we can earn our way to God, ignorant of the righteousness of God. And so he says in, in 21, he says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? And this is really important that, that Paul in all of this teaching is not throwing out the Bible. He's actually calling us to be more biblical. He's not saying, hey, we used to follow the Bible, now Jesus came and now we don't. He's saying, no, if we're going to really follow the Bible, we need to know what it's all about. We need to know the story. We need to know the kind of of righteousness that God requires. We need to know how he provides it. We need to know what the Bible actually says. And so verse 22, this is where it starts to get a little bit complicated. He, He brings up a story from their book of the law. The first five books of the Bible were considered to be the book of the law to the, to the Jews. And so he brings up this story from, from their Bible to show them that their trying to follow all the rules was actually not very biblical. So verse 22, he says, For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Okay, so this is why this is one of the the hard ones to, to grasp. Um, so, so, so Paul's trying to drive home his point about us being free from the law, and he uses this allegory or this illustration from the story of Abraham, who had two sons. And, and in that story, it begins in Genesis chapter 12, God calls to this old man, Abraham. He's, he's 75, she's 65, his wife, Sarah, and, and he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the world through you. So leave your father's house. So they pack up and they leave Ur of the Chaldees and they start making this journey into Canaan. And and they're just believing this promise. God has promised that somehow, even though we don't have a child, that we're going to have a child. But then the years start to pass and there's still no child and there's still no child. God made this promise and it wasn't being fulfilled. So they started to say, all right, we have to do something. We have to do something to fulfill this promise. And so in Genesis 15, Abraham marries an additional wife. Hagar, the slave woman, and then she has a child named Ishmael. So notice what they're doing here. They're adding their works to the promises of God. 
They're relying on their own plan. They're doing something to make God's promise comes true, come true. And so more, more years pass. Abraham's now 99, Sarah's 89, and then the Lord comes to him. And he says, good news, this time next year, your wife, Sarah, is going to have a child. So the Lord's saying this to Abraham. Sarah is on the other side of the wall of the tent, and she just starts laughing herself silly as she hears this. And so in Genesis 18, verse 13, it says, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> and so, sure enough, with, without any scheming, without any planning, without them adding anything at all to the promise of God this time, the next year, Isaac is born of Sarah. And so Paul looks at this whole thing again, verse 23, and he says, the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. So Ishmael was born through works, through doing, through self-reliance. Isaac was born by God's grace. And so Ishmael's descendants, they become the Arabs, while, while Isaac fathers Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel, whose children become the children of the promise. And, and so Paul here is clearly making the point that your effort doesn't contribute anything to the fulfillment of God's promise. That you don't get to God by doing your own thing. You don't get to God by your own scheming. You don't get to God by adding to, to the promise that he's given you. But then he complexifies it in verse 24 when he says, now this may be interpreted allegorically, these women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She's Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she's in slavery with her children but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Okay, so what in the world is he saying here? Well, he's talking about these two covenants. And, and a covenant is the same word as testament. In our Bibles, we have the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the description of what went on under the Old Covenant. The New Testament is the description that, of what went on under the New Covenant. And in a covenant, John Stott's definition is a solemn agreement between God and men by which he makes them his people and promises to be their God. And so God established the old covenant through Moses when he gave the law on Mount Sinai, and he established the new covenant through Jesus. That old covenant was based on laws, while the new covenant was based on promises. And in the old covenant, under the law, God laid the responsibility on people, and he said, do all this. Under the new covenant, God took on himself all the responsibility and he did all that needed to be done in Jesus. And so, so Paul here is comparing Hagar, the slave woman who bears Ishmael, a child, through works, to the old covenant that God made at Mount Sinai. So what's he trying to say here? Um, if, if you've got your Bible, if you could turn to Exodus 19, I want to kind of show you what happened at Mount Sinai. And I know this is going to be foggy for a minute, but we'll get there, I promise. Uh, Exodus 19, verse 1, um, the, the Israelites are, are wandering under the leadership of Moses here. And it says, On the third new moon, after the promise of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation." These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and he called the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So notice how this old covenant worked. God says, here are the rules. Obey these commands and you will be my kingdom. You will be my people and you'll be able to stay in this land that I've given you. The people hear all those commands, the Ten Commandments, and they're so full of themselves as they hear these commandments that they say, yep, all these things we will do. We'll do all of them. 
and so was struck the deal. Where you have perfect God requiring perfect obedience and the people saying, all these things we will do. But as we read God's law, that's not supposed to be our immediate response when we hear what God requires of us. We're supposed to to read what he requires, read the commandments, read the moral law, and we're supposed to think this is really good. This is really right. I want to strive to follow this. God is really holy, and I'm going to strive. But this is Mount Everest. I'm going to need some help. I can't do this on my own. In fact, knowing myself, knowing my heart and hearing about this holiness of God, if my obedience gets me there, I'm dead. I'm going to need grace. I'm going to need a savior. That's what we're supposed to do when we hear God's commands. But these people weren't there yet. Their response was more religious self-reliance. We will do all these things. So just like Abraham and Sarah responded to God's promise with self-reliance by producing Ishmael through Hagar, the Jews responded to God's commands in the law through self-reliance. And then the rest of the Old Testament is the story of these people who said all these things we will do, failing to do all these things again and again and again and breaking that covenant. And so look again at chapter 4, verse 25 in Galatians. He says, now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she's in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. And so the story of Hagar, the story of self-reliance, adding my works, trusting my works, is just like the story of Mount Sinai where the people were trusting in, in their works. And it's fitting actually that Mount Sinai actually sits in Arabia, the place that was populated by Ishmael's descendants. So you have the, the, the Arabs who were loved by God and he promised unique care for them but they populated this place um, where where they all lived around there and their origin story was the story of self-reliance as opposed to believing God's promise. And right in the middle of their territory is the mountain of self-reliance, Mount Sinai. And then Paul takes this little shot at the Judaizers. He says, Mount Sinai, law from God, do all these things to, to get to God, worship at the temple, offer the sacrifices, follow the feast days. It's all part of the old covenant reality that's represented by present-day Jerusalem, and that just is the the way of slavery. And Paul says that system is done. We belong to Jerusalem above, and Jerusalem above is free. We're part of this new covenant where we're the people of God through Jesus. We don't have a physical temple here. We don't have a physical capital city here because that was all part of the old covenant that was replaced with the new. Hebrews says this, the book of Hebrews is all about this. In Hebrews 13, 12, it says, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. So Jesus came on the scene and he, he's the one who kept that old covenant perfectly. He said to his father, all these things I will do. And then he did them. But then he went to the cross where he took on himself our punishment and he gives us, if we believe in him, the record of his perfect obedience. So in a sense, we are saved by good works, but it's the good works of Jesus. That Jesus worked perfectly. Jesus fully followed the command and then Jesus died to to pay the punishment that the law demanded when we failed to obey it, even though he never failed to obey it. And so Paul is saying, what you have in Jesus is so much better than that old system. So don't go back. You have the real thing in Jesus. And this new covenant is not just an upgraded version of all these things we will do. It's good news. It's the good news that Jesus has done it. It's the good news that Jesus helps those who can never help themselves up the mountain of God's holiness. And that we don't contribute to that journey at all. He carries us there. And then Paul brings in one more Old Testament illustration. He quotes from Isaiah 54, and he says in verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of the promise. And that rejoice, O barren one verse was originally aimed at the Jews in captivity. 
They'd been carried away by Babylon, and it was predicted that when they came back into the land, they would come back in more numerous than they were before. And Paul says, that's going on now. This new covenant reality is the coming out of captivity of God's people to a people that are far more numerous, a people that are made up of Jews and Gentiles, a people that are far more diverse, made up of people from all nations, and that we're coming to a capital city that's not Jerusalem and Israel, but Jerusalem above. And so he says, why would you guys go back to making Christianity into an old covenant religion? And I think seeing this, seeing this arc in the biblical story is incredibly relevant when it comes to us understanding what the Bible is talking about when we read it. Um, so, so for example, if you want to turn to Matthew 21, this is a passage I recently heard one of the new atheists just mocking this passage. Um, and we, we read in Matthew, and we're going to go through Matthew, Lord willing, starting in the fall. And you see this uh, amazing story in Matthew of Jesus who speaks these brilliant words that have shaped cultures in the Beatitudes, who goes to the cross, who conquers death. You see this amazing picture of Jesus, but then something in there could seem somewhat out of place. Um, in verse 18, in Matthew 21, this is four days before the crucifixion in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. It says, in the morning as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. And so this new atheist I was listening to is like, look at this guy. Like, we're worshiping this guy? I mean, he comes up to a fig tree in the springtime. Figs bear their, their fruit in the summertime, so it's not even supposed to have fruit on it. It's like being mad at an apple tree right now for not having apples on it. And so Jesus comes up to this fig tree, goes there, there are no figs on it, and he seems angry, and he says, may you never bear fruit again, and he curses the fig tree, and the, fig wi and the, the thing withers. So why would, like, this Jesus that we worship be so mad at a tree? Well, he wasn't. In fact, he wasn't mad at a tree at all. And if you read through the, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and Hosea and Jeremiah, you see the nation of Israel depicted as a fig tree that's supposed to bear fruit for God. And so here's Jesus, right about to be crucified, going up to the temple. This whole Old Covenant system that has its headquarters in Jerusalem, headquartered in the temple, is about to put Jesus to death. Now remember, this whole system existed to point people to Jesus. All those blood sacrifices so were, were so that we would know who Jesus was when he came. All the rules, all the laws were to send us running to Jesus. Jesus shows up and that old system rejects him. And so Jesus looks at the, the old covenant system. He looks at the, the nation that's not bearing fruit. And he says, may you never bear fruit again. He's taking that old covenant and chucking it because it's being replaced with the new one. Now, Keep reading, Matthew 21, verse 20, it says, When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what's been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So Jesus says that if you have faith and don't doubt, you can cast this mountain into the sea. But have any of us done that? Like, who with their faith can say, I have moved mountains. This has happened. Like, I believed something enough that I was able to kind of do the, the Harry Potter spell and just move that thing. I was able to do that by my faith. Most of us haven't done that. And then how often have we, if we're honest, have we had the metaphorical mountain in our lives? And we read this verse and we think, if I could just believe harder, I could get rid of every problem. So every problem in our lives, whether it's sickness, whether it's a relational struggle, the things that we're, we're praying about, that, that, that we're asking God to do, but they seem like they won't go away. If they're not going away, don't we now need to feel guilty? Because if I just believed more, I could throw that mountain into the sea. And this is often used as like a prosperity gospel proof text, that if we just have enough faith, we can remove any of the problems that are in our lives. But notice here that, that Jesus doesn't say if you have enough faith that you can move mountains in general. He also isn't saying that if you have enough faith, then that guarantees that you can move any of those intractable problems that are in your life. He says, this mountain. And they were on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. 
So if you have faith in Jesus, that whole mountain is thrown into the sea. You no longer need all the temple-related rules and regulations. This, this new covenant has come where, where by faith you get the righteousness of Jesus to present to the Father. You don't need to do any more atoning for sin with sacrifice. You just need faith in Jesus who was the final sacrifice. Your faith takes that whole old covenant system centered on that temple mount, throws it all into the sea. And now we certainly pray asking for God to do things and do big miraculous things. He's generous and kind. He does amazing things as we pray. But this passage is not saying believe harder and you can do anything you want. It's actually better news than that. He's throwing the temple system with all its requirements, with all of the do this and you shall live into the sea. And then four days after cursing the fig tree, after talking about what will happen to the mountain if you have faith, Jesus went to the cross. And when he hung there, the veil that separated God from people was ripped down the middle. That mountain, the one that he was talking about, that quaked and the rocks split. And when he rose from the dead three days later, he came bringing this new and better covenant where we become God's people by faith in the perfect and finished work of Jesus, not through all these things we will do. So maybe you're bringing in this morning some guilt because there's a problem that won't go away no matter how hard you believe it will. And so you're wondering, well, is my faith real? I've really been trying hard to believe that my parents would change. I've really tried to, to believe that my, my kid would walk with the Lord or that the cancer treatments would work this time. And, and no matter how sure I am that this time it'll really happen, it seems like the changes aren't coming. And so now I feel guilty. I just must not believe enough. It must be that there's something wrong with me. Listen, keep, keep praying and keep casting your cares and worries on the Lord. But don't believe the guilt-inducing lie that every intractable problem in your life is just because you didn't believe enough. That's not what Jesus was saying here. Jesus is saying that faith in him gives us all the good works that that temple system required because Jesus did them all. And the sacrifice it required was taken care of as he was sacrificed on the cross. His blood has been spilled. That means all the guilt and the shame that we carry can be lifted. And it's not going to be lifted in an old covenant way. We're not going to get rid of our guilt and our shame with more religious observance, through repeating the same prayer enough times, through making more sacrifices. It's not even going to be taken away by our giving back, by our tithing, by our serving, by our going to church. It's lifted by Jesus. If you have faith, you can say to that mountain, the mountain of works righteousness, the temple mountain, throw yourself into the sea. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Free from the insecurities, the wondering, am, am I good enough for God? The wondering, might, might I have sinned and not known it and I need to atone for it? Frees us from the treadmill of all the do this and you shall live. All those daily efforts to save face and look the part and pretend to be without failings and maintain a Christian image like a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones, we're, all freed, we're freed from all of that because that all corresponds to present-day Jerusalem. It all comes from that law-based thinking. Law says, do this and you shall live. The gospel says, believe and live. So Paul's like, guys, don't go back. Don't miss the plot of the whole story. Live like free people. Live like the children of the promise. You're, you're Isaac. You're not Ishmael. And he's, he's not throwing out righteousness. He's not throwing out holiness. He's not throwing out hard work. Hard work is good, and it can achieve a lot. We should be hard workers. Obedience is good, and the Christian life is a life of, of striving for obedience to Jesus. Giving is good as an act of worship, and serving is required of us in a source of tremendous joy in our lives. But none of those things gets us to him. And if we rely on those things to save us, we'll miss him. So can I just invite you in? Like Christians, if we are judgmental and graceless, we need to hear this warning not to go back. If we're becoming Christian Pharisees, scrutinizing one another, we need to run to Christ. And if you have renounced and repented of your sin and confessed it to Jesus, trusting in his cross with just a mustard seed of faith. Don't act like you're not free. 
You're going back to the old covenant if, if you forever feel guilty and ashamed and defiled and unworthy. One of the characteristics of that old covenant system was that it was constant sacrifices. Like you would offer a sheep for, for a sin and, and next year another sheep was going to get it. Like there were going to be more and more. The, the temple was known for just being covered in blood where the sacrifices were made because again and again and again you had to make the sacrifices. It was never fully enough. The whole thing was there to remind us that we need to have our sins atoned for, but also to remind us that there's nothing we can do to fully atone. But then Jesus came and from the cross, he cried, it's finished. He atoned, that's done. He was finally, once for all, sacrificed for all who would believe. It's enough. And so that means that Christians, we can boldly approach our Father in prayer and not think, well, these people must have better access to him because they've done more, they've atoned more, they've been doing this longer. You can rest knowing that God is good and kind. And not just that he's good and kind in general, but he's good and kind to you. Not just those other people who are better at keeping up with their works. And you can have real joy because life doesn't have to be waiting for the other divine shoe to drop. You can expect more of his kindness and blessing. And then for those of you who are not Christians, Christianity does uphold a moral code of right and wrong that we believe corresponds to the righteousness of God. And, and all of us have sinned. We've all broken those commands. We've all broken that code. And God is a just judge. He is holy. We'll stand before him when we die. We'll give an account for our lives. And just punishment is doled out for our sin. There, there is wrath and hell for violating his infinite perfect holiness. But what a lot of people believe is that Christians think that the way back in, the way back to God, is by trying to keep the code now. It's by saying all these things we will do and then really doing them from here on out. But Jesus came to try to throw that thinking into the sea. We can't scale Everest. Jesus perfectly kept the law. He perfectly kept the code. He went to the cross in our place. He died and he rose. And we receive that as a free gift if we'll turn to him in belief. Now to turn to him, we have to turn from something. We turn from self, we turn from sin, we turn from self-righteousness, and then we believe. We believe that he died, we believe that he rose, we believe that it was enough. Yeah, the way out from God was through our sin, but the way back in is not through our righteousness, but through the righteousness of Jesus, and we get it by faith, not by the things we do. So then Paul closes this section out with a final encouragement, verse 29, he says, but just at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we're not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So he says that there's always been like some persecution and some opposition from those who would justify themselves by works. The people who think that they've earned a spot with God because of the good things that they've done. There'll be some, some opposition from people like that toward people who believe that we get grace for free. And sometimes that's because of pride, because I want, you know, my morality kind of gives me a leg up. I want to feel better than other people. Because of jealousy. I think, why do they deserve this and I don't? It's because we have such a hard time believing that anything is free. There are lots of reasons that, that those who think that their righteousness comes from the things that they do might want to push aside all these people who think they're getting it for free. And ultimately, just like it was for the Pharisees in the days uh, when Jesus was walking the earth, Jesus is a threat. Religious Pharisees today who think that they're good enough and superior and have earned their place with God and who, who sleep better thinking, well, at least I didn't do that thing those other people did. They do want to persecute those who have free grace, just like the Pharisees persecuted Jesus. So Paul warns to expect that. He warns to expect Judaizers, he warns us to expect it from people with a similar mind, but don't let it steal your freedom. And don't be like them. Don't be a Pharisee. Live free. And don't go back to that mindset that says it's my self-reliance that'll get me to God. It'll always bring ruin. Don't go back to relying on the things that you add to Jesus to make yourself a real Christian and an elite Christian. 
Don't go back to image management. That'll eventually all collapse and fall apart. Trust in Christ and him alone. Live out these new covenant realities. And one of the ways that we anchor our hearts again in Jesus is we participate in the new covenant renewal ceremony, which is the Lord's Supper. When we eat this bread and we drink this wine, we're reminding ourselves that we come to God through the torn body and the shed blood of Jesus, not through our efforts. And, and while we take this supper, we're publicly proclaiming, I actually believe this. I believe this to be true. And this has implications horizontally and implications vertically. If we are accepted because of Jesus's work, that means that everybody else who is clinging to Jesus and repenting of sin is accepted because of Jesus's work too. And they're accepted by God and accepted by us. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul's laying out instructions for this, this new covenant renewal ceremony in the Lord's Supper, he says this in verse 17, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in, heart, in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So these Corinthian Christians, they were using the Lord's Supper to flaunt their superiority. Uh, some of them were more wealthy than the others, and so they had more flexible jobs. They owned the companies. So they could get there and take the Lord's Supper before everybody else. And then there were the, the slaves or the low-level workers, and they would get there late whenever the boss would let them off of work. And by the time they show up, there's nothing left over. They walk in, and, and some guys are getting drunk on the communion wine. They're, they're totally disregarding the symbolism of all of this. And so here you have this community that's supposed to reflect the reality portrayed in the supper that Jesus died for sin, that all who come to God through Christ are equals around the table, that there's no superiority in the kingdom, there's no superior class within Christianity, there's no superior race within Christianity, there are no superior packages of sin within Christianity. The gospel levels us all and tells us that we all need Jesus and that there's more than enough Jesus for all of us. And so that's part of what the supper symbolizes. And these people instead were dividing. They were allowing the reality in their community to not reflect the reality of the cross that's painted by the Lord's Supper. So Paul says, when you do that, it's not even the Lord's Supper. And then he says, and here's what it is, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So each sip of communion wine is a reminder that we're part of this new covenant. Each bite of bread is a reminder that the, the Lord's death is the only thing that makes us acceptable to God. And so we eat this supper with a lot of joy because of what Jesus did for us, but also fully confessing our sin, fully intending to mend any holes in the new covenant community that is the church that we've made. And this comes with a warning that we've got to do that right. Verse 27, he says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we're judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This is a, a stark warning of the Lord's discipline if we eat or drink the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way. But what's an unworthy way? What's well, denying the reality that this supper is, is telling us about. The, the torn bread 
shows us that Jesus' body had to be torn for us, which means that sin is serious. So if we take the supper, we, we should never take it without confessing our sin. Without confessing the relational problems that we've created without, without our, our plan to mend them. And we should never take this if we're not letting go of our sin and renouncing it. We should never take this saying, well, yeah, I'm just going to keep doing that thing because of grace. That's not how grace works. But then another unworthy way to take the supper is to believe that we have to earn our own worthiness and to think that we're worthy on our own. If we take this supper in any way bragging about our own personal righteousness, we're missing the message of this supper. If we take this believing that it's my goodness that gets me to God, that betrays the entire symbol that's presented by this supper. So we take this believing in Jesus, the people who are invited to take this are those who believe in Christ. We take it confessing all of our known sins and renouncing them. But also we take it saying in Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. I'm not enough, but he is. His torn body, his spilled blood, that's what the new covenant is all wrapped up in, not my works. And what he provided on that cross is more than enough, and it's finished. Mm-hmm.